Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm gonna be rattling on about things that I really think you should care about. Uh, if you have any reactions to the show, contact me directly, whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com, that's my email address. Uh, or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, uh, and you can leave a comment there if you'd like. If um, you do email me, I only ask that, as always, you include something in the subject line, like, you know, left side of the aisle or something, so I know it's not spam, and uh, be a little patient, because I'm actually kind of slow about dealing with email. All right, with those traditional introductions out of the way, let's get to it. Uh, we have some sort of good news to start off the day. Um, before the State of the Union address, I saw a headline, something along the lines of that leftists and progressives were preparing themselves to be disappointed in the speech. Well, the speech came and lo and behold, we weren't disappointed about being disappointed. Uh, like way too much that comes out of the mouth of President Hopi Changi, there was a lot of lofty talk and almost no specifics. A lot of, I will do this and I will do that by executive order without actually doing any of it. With one exception, that is the good news. Under an executive order announced by the White House uh, in advance of the speech, uh, some low-wage uh, federally contracted workers will see an increase in their minimum wage to $10.10 an hour. The full scope of the program isn't clear, but it could mean a raise of up to $2.85 an hour for hundreds of thousands of workers uh, working for federal contractors. Um, now, of course, you have to take part of that back because, first off, this program only applies to future federal contracts, and it doesn't even re uh, apply to renewal of existing contracts unless other terms are also changed. Uh, and what's more, it, uh, this order fails to address the other two issues raised by low-wage workers. Um, there is this outfit, Good Jobs Nation, it's called. They're the people that uh, are organizing and coordinating those kind of rapid-fire one-day strikes uh, that have been happening among non-union and low-wage workers at federal contractors, like the people, uh, the cleaning and concession workers who did this at the Pentagon just last week. Uh, the other two concerns, by the way, those are to, one, strengthen the enforcement of labor law, uh, enforcement, labor law enforcement, I should say, against scofflaw contractors, and to beef up workers' organizing rights. Because without those, the increased pay is going to mean not a whole lot to people who are facing employer illegalities and retaliation as they struggle to form unions so they can raise themselves up without having to worry about another executive order. On the other hand, despite its shortcomings and its limitations and failures, something which always seems to be true of what comes out of the White House these days, um, Let's take some pleasure in the fact that anyone's minimum pay, minimum wage, is actually being raised, and especially take pleasure in the fact that this is happening because of the militant labor action that has taken place over the past several months. All right, we are now going to spend a few minutes remembering someone who was probably as close to a living legend as anyone gets to be these days, Pete Seeger, who died January 27th at the age of 94. Uh, an article about his music in the San Jose Mercury News really nailed it. Uh, f Pete Seeger, it said, was folk music. He was, very likely more than any other single person or influence, responsible for America discovering or more exactly, rediscovering its folk roots. Uh, the Weavers, a quartet founded in, in 1948, which uh, consisted of, of Pete Seeger, Lee Hayes, Ronnie Gilbert, and Fred Hellerman, uh, certainly set the stage for the folk revival uh, with hits such as, and actual hits, such as Goodnight Irene, Tsenya Tsenya, and On Top of Old Smoky. But the thing is, Pete Seeger wasn't just about preserving the past, like in a glass jar. I remember there was an occasion when, during the folk revival of the 1960s, uh, someone complained that uh, people were writing new folk songs rather than just preserving the old ones. And his response was, 
don't interfere with the folk process. He has been credited with popularizing the song We Shall Overcome, which became you know, the anthem of the civil rights movement of the 60s. And he also wrote or co-wrote If I Had a Hammer, Turn, 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 Where Have All the Flowers Gone, and Kisses Sweeter Than Wine. He dropped out of Harvard in 1938 and hit the road learning folk songs while he hitchhiked, hitchhiked and uh, hot freight trains around the country. And by 1940, he was part of a group performing uh, benefits for disaster relief and other causes. He and his friend Woody Guthrie toured migrant camps and union halls. Uh, he sang on overseas radio broadcast for the Office of War Information at, uh, in the early parts of World War II. In the Army, he entertained soldiers in the South Pacific. And as the years went on after the war, he sang in support of workers and for peace and against racism, the death penalty, and nuclear power. He never stopped singing or performing in a career that spanned 70 years. Now, the thing is though, perhaps one of his proudest moments did not involve singing, or at least it would be, if it was me, it would have been one of my proudest moments in my life. This is in August 1955 when he stared down the House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC, a congressional panel aimed at uncovering the commies that they were convinced were under every bedstead. The committee kept demanding of him to know if he had sang to this Communist Party group or at that Communist Party gathering or as part of the other Communist Party benefit. He simply refused to answer, told I won't tell you. Wait, wait, the committee goes like, no, are, are you pleading the Fifth Amendment? No, he says, I'm not pleading the Fifth Amendment. I'm just not going to tell you. I says, I, you know, I'll tell you about my songs, he said. I'll tell you about what the songs are about, I'll tell you about the songs I've sung, but I won't tell you where I've sung them or who I've sung them to because that's none of your business. Finally, they gave up asking. He was charged with 10 counts of contempt of Congress, sentenced to a year in prison. The conviction, happily for him, was later overturned on appeal. But as a result of this defiance, he was blackballed from network TV and recording contracts for over 10 years. He finally got back on TV in 1967 when the Smothers Brothers had him on. Still, there was controversy over even that. CBS deleted his Vietnam protest song, Waist Deep in the Big, uh, Big Muddy, with what became its famous refrain, We're waist deep in the Big Muddy, the Big Fool says to push on. Five months later, he came back on the show, was able to finish the song, but even then, at least one station censored the last verse. In the late 1960s, he founded the group Clearwater to support the sloop of the same name, which had been built by volunteer labor, and it sailed up and down the Hudson River, um, giving, um, uh, raising money and raising awareness about the need to clean up the Hudson River. By the 1990s, he was being heaped with honors. He performed at the Kennedy Center in 1994. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1996. In 2006, Bruce Springsteen did an album in his honor. In 2009, he was treated to and performed in a concert at Madison Square Garden for his 90th birthday. He was an activist till the very end. In 2011, at the age of 92, he walked two miles through Manhattan as part of an Occupy march and protest. His ever-present banjo was actually not present because he had to use two canes in order to walk, but he walked the whole distance. His wife Toshi, a remarkable woman in her own right, died in July at the age of 91, just 11 days short of their 70th anniversary. And now this, as someone accurately described him, this ever-so-gentle rabble-rouser has rejoined her. You know, the thing is, I never thought that much of Pete Seeger as a singer. But his compassion, his conviction, his conscience, what you might colloquially call his soul, more than made up for it. Be wary of great leaders, he said after the Occupy March. Hope that there are many, many small leaders. On that account, he did his part. In fact, a lot more than his part. So, R.I.P. Pete Seeger. And talking about Pete Seeger and activism and so on sort of brings me to something else I wanted to talk about. Um, the fact is, government spying on us is neither new, uh, is nothing new, and neither are active attempts by the government to disrupt or better yet undermine its opposition. 
During the dreaded 1960s, there was a lot of talk in the movement about government uh, agents and sometimes an irritating, a sometimes irritating number of half-serious remarks about paranoia, which became even more irritating when they were more than half serious. Well, the boldest course in the face of this, which was pursued actually by most people in the movement, was simply to assume that you were being watched and just go ahead and do what you were going to do anyway. Uh, in fact, at one point around 1969 or 1970, it was estimated that something like 7 million Americans uh, had files being kept on them by the FBI. And it became a, a running gag in the movement that you would be really disappointed if it turned out you weren't one of them. Anyway, the point here. On March 8, 1971, a group of anti-war activists calling themselves the Citizens Com Commission to Investigate the FBI broke into the FBI field office in Media, Pennsylvania and made off with hundreds of pages of secret counterintelligence files which they released to the media. The documents prove the existence of exactly the sort of program that the movement had long suspected. It was called COINTELPRO, which stood for Counterintelligence Program, and was devoted to destroying a range of peace, civil rights, new left, student, and black power groups that the FBI's deranged director, J. Edgar Hoover, was convinced were out to destroy America. Under this plan, the FBI spied, infiltrated, and wiretapped. It planted rumors, intimidated activists with repeated interviews designed to, quoting Hoover's mem memo, enhance the paranoia endemic in these circles and make them think there's an FBI agent behind every mailbox. It used agent provocateurs to spark internal dissension or to provoke groups into actions that would discredit them in the eyes of the public. It sent out anonymous letters, including a notorious one that tried to blackmail Martin Luther King Jr. into committing suicide. In the wake of this theft, Hoover sent out 200 FBI agents to track down the people involved. They failed. The case was never solved, and the FBI finally gave up, closing the case two days after the statute of limitations had expired. Now, nearly 43 years later, five of the group have come forward, and a book on the event called The Burglary came out earlier this month. Now, I haven't read this book yet, but I fully intend to, because let it be a reminder that while the scope of the spying today is orders of magnitude beyond anything done or even possible in the 50s and 60s, the viciousness of that era has yet to be repeated. But the fact is, as long as the capability is there, the threat remains. And because of that orders of magnitude difference in scope, what could be unleashed at any moment now would likewise be far worse than that which we survived and in fact struck back against then. And by the way, I have one personal note about this especially. I'm reading about this. I uh, was reading said, oh yes, and it said, uh, one of the articles said that the brain, it was the brainchild of William Davidon, a physics professor at Haverford College near Pennsylvania who was, what? Well, what, William Davidon? Bill Davidon? I knew this guy. I worked with this guy. I worked with his wife, Ann Morris at Davidon, on the National Committee of the War Resisters League. I knew these people. He never mentioned this, never discussed it, never referred to it. One of the reasons that they were never caught is because they agreed. They never met together as a group after this, and uh, they just didn't discuss it with anybody. So I actually knew the, uh, the brains behind the whole operation and had no idea he was involved. Oh well, we're going to take a break. Hi, we're back. All right, um, it might come as a surprise to some of you out there, or at least a few of you out there, uh, the notion that creationism, this bizarre idea that the world is like 6,000 years old and evolution doesn't exist, that creationism is being taught in science classes in schools across much of the country. There are at least hundreds of schools that are in essence using the Bible as a science textbook. The thing is, I am not referring here to private fundamentalist religious schools, but to taxpayer supported schools, charter schools, and even in some cases, public schools. 
In Texas, there is a publicly funded charter school program system which operates 65 campuses across the state with 20 more going up this year. They do it and there's no need for them to be coy about it. No need for them to kind of sneak it in because the state science education standards allow teachers to present alternatives to evolution. With the result, how, this is how far it goes, the opening line of, this, of the system's workbook on the subject begins with, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In addition to this, recent laws in Louisiana and Tennessee allow teachers in any public school in those states to, uh, again, teach alternatives to evolution. In Florida, Indiana, Ohio, Arizona, Washington, D.C., and other places, taxpayer money is funding creationist private schools through tuition vouchers or scholarship programs. And what's the kind of thinking behind this? What kind of thinking does this kind of thinking lead to? Well, that brings us to one of our regular weekly features. It's the Clown Award, given for meritorious stupidity. Susanna Tennis is one of two candidates for the Gopper nomination to challenge Democratic Representative Jan Schakowsky for her congressional seat this year. She describes herself as a conservative Republican who believes in God first. And she sure does. During what the suburban Chicago Daily Herald called an endorsement session with the, uh, both, both of these candidates had with the paper's editorial board, this is on January 20th, she declared that she believes that God controls the weather and God has put tornadoes and diseases such as autism and dementia on earth as punishment for gay rights and legalized abortion. God is angry, she said. Actually, Susie, if there was a God, I suspect most of that supreme anger would be directed at twits like you. Uh, she was bad enough about this that state and local leaders in the Republican Party in Illinois insisted the party has absolutely nothing to do with her. Now, her opponent in this primary is no prize either. He's a Ron Paul supporter who favors doing away with uh, all income taxes and replacing them with a 23% national sales tax. He opposes raising the minimum wage and, oh yeah, has an outstanding domestic violence protection order against him. But still, it takes real skill to rise to the level that Susan Atanis has achieved. Suzanne Atanis, champion level clown. All right, something else that I haven't talked about in a while, I've been meaning to, should, should get back to. Uh... Perhaps the best single line in the entire State of the Union address was, climate change is a fact. Something rarely said just so flatly, matter-of-factly by any politician. Obama pledged to, in the words of Washington Post columnist Ryan Cooper, finish what he has started. And indeed, there are things that he can do by executive order, things entirely within his authority, his legal authority as president, things that he can do to reduce our national output of greenhouse gases. The problem is, as all too often happens with President Hopi Changey, we've heard it all before. A year ago, he said, quoting, We will respond to the threat of climate change knowing that the failure to do so would betray our children and future generations. Grand statement, which was followed by what? Now, yeah, there were a couple of good moves. For example, he uh, directed the EPA to uh, develop new emission standards for carbon emissions from power plants. But it's months later, the rule still isn't finalized. As all too often happens, the words soar, but the deeds crawl. And the fact is, we don't have time to crawl. We don't have time for eventually. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, found that 2013 tied for the fourth hottest year on record. That is the worldwide average. Uh, these records date back to 1880. NASA, which calculates the records in a somewhat different manner, said 2013 was the seventh hottest year on record. 
But both agencies have said that nine of the ten hottest years on record have occurred in the 21st century. And what's more, the 13 years of this century, 20, uh, 2001 to 2013, all 13 of them are among the 15 hottest years on record. And it's going to get worse. According to a new study by researchers in Australia, at the rate the Earth is currently warming, temperatures will rise a full 4 degrees Celsius by 2100. That is twice the amount of warming that climatologists can say can be tolerated by the environment without severe damaging effects on the environment we depend on to, to live. And frankly, an increasing number of scientists are saying that even that 2 degree limit was too high. To make it even more depressing, uh, these researchers noted that while climate change models certainly are not perfect, the mistakes that they're making are much more frequently by predicting less warming than actually occurs rather than by predicting more warming than actually occurs. And the effects already being seen. Climatologists have long been careful to avoid connecting particular weather events to global warming, but increasingly that's no longer true. For one example, a study recently published in the peer-reviewed scientific journal Nature Climate Change concludes that the current rate of carbon emissions, the current rate of carbon emissions, would mean twice as many extreme El Nino events over the next 100 years, twice as many as there would otherwise be, which would have profound socio-economic environmental consequences. The last extreme El Nino was in 1997 to 1998. It resulted in the hottest year on records and produced floods, cyclones, droughts, and wildfires that killed at least 23,000 people and caused scores of billions of dollars in property damage, especially to food production. Now, if this paper's uh, conclusions are borne out by further study, it would be devastating because this kind of climate change is, in the words of one, the lead researcher, essentially an irreversible change. It would take generations of reduced carbon output in order to undo this damage that would have been done. You know, the fact is, right now, today, we adult generations, my generation, the next lower generation, you know, the adult generations of this world, particularly of this nation, we have to suck it up and realize that we have to do something. We have to change our ways. We have to change our ways dramatically. We have to actually tolerate some inconvenience. Or our children and grandchildren are going to pay a drastic, even a catastrophic price. We have no time for eventually. We have no time to crawl. All right. Last thing. We're going to wrap this up with our other regular weekly feature. It's the outrage of the week. Some quick facts for you, which none of which I expect will come as a surprise. Long-term unemployment is the worst ever. Tens of millions of people in this country continue to live in poverty. Real wages stagnate or fall. During the so-called economic recovery of 2009 to 2012, the incomes of the richest 1% in this nation went up by 32%, while the incomes of the rest went up 0.4%. Put another way, 95% of the gains went to the richest 1%, with 5% left over for everybody else. In 2012, the top 10% got half of all of the income in the United States, surpassing even the peak uh, stock market bubble of the Roaring Twenties. The richest 1% got 22.5%. That is nearly a quarter of our, all our national income went to the richest 1%. Five years after the financial collapse, few but the very richest are anything but worse off. But who are we supposed to feel sorry for? The rich. The poor, besieged, maligned rich. The latest in a long line of sniveling whiners blubbering about how hard, it live, how hard it is to live at their yachts and their mansions because people are so mean to me is one Thomas Perkins, a venture capitalist worth about $8 billion, who it seems lives in constant fear that the unwashed hordes are going to come and get him. 
In a recent letter he wrote to the, a letter to the editor, he wrote to the Wall Street Journal, he said, these are quotes. I would call attention to the parallels of fascist Nazi Germany to its war on its 1%, the Jews, to the progressive war on the American 1%, the rich. I perceive a rising tide of hatred of the successful 1%. This is a very dangerous drift in our American thinking. Kristallnacht was unthinkable in 1930. Is its descendant progressive radicalism unthinkable now? That's right. According to Thomas Perkins, being a billionaire in the United States in 2013 is just like being a Jew in Nazi Germany. And in case you thought that he was drunk or doping or that he would clarify because he misspoke or miswrote, I suppose. Um, If you thought that, you'd be wrong. In a subsequent email to Bloomberg.com, he declared that in the Nazi era, it was racial demonization. Now it is class demonization. Of course, he's the one engaging there in class demonization since he just basically said that everybody poorer than him is a real or potential Nazi, but folks like him are often irony challenged. The... um, important point here is, oh, by the way, he did actually, uh, the next day, after another day, a, a second day being ridiculed, he um, said that, well, he, uh, he took back the, wor- the word Kristallnacht. He was sorry he used that term, but he didn't take back the message that we're all Nazis. The important point anyway here, is that he's by no means alone in this. He's just the latest. David Sirota offered a few more. Uh, Supermarket uh, mogul John Kastamatidis reacted to a proposal to raise taxes on the rich by comparing it to how Hitler punished the Jews. Uh, Private equity mogul Stephen Schwartzman called a proposal to tax private equity income as the same rate of other, other income like when Hitler invaded Poland. When Senator Chuck Schumer offered a bill to close tax loopholes that were abused primarily by the super-rich, Grover Norquist of Americans for Tax Freedom said that, uh, he also said, by the way, that the Nazis were for higher marginal tax rates. He said in response to Schumer's proposal that he just probably translated a law from 1930s Germany. And you may remember this one, AIG CEO Robert Ben Mosh swearing that anger over, the, over his bailed out company's bonuses was just as bad as lynching of blacks uh, in the Jim Crow South. The point is, this is how they think of you. This is how they think of you. You are an incohate, jealous, threatening mass of unwashed, ignorant savages, Nazis. In their minds, the 85 people who hold as much wealth as 3.5 billion other people are not grasping, selfish, insanely rich winners. They are a persecuted diaspora in constant risk of annihilation. Well, frankly, for my part, I can't wait for the day when their nightmare comes true. For the moment, I'll confine myself to just saying that people such as Thomas Perkins and the rest of them are morally degenerate outrages. That's going to be it for this week. Uh, I'll mention, I'm going to tell a little bit more about this week. Uh, There is a ceasefire, apparently, in South Sudan, um, which, again, is something I care about. Um, So that was at least a bit of good news. But we will see you next week. In the meantime, have the best week you possibly can, and peace.